Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Every character in Netland is uniquely designed and is made to represent each tribe of the region. But every character is also packed with inspiration from different real-life places and cultures that make up the entirety of what Netland could be. Granted, I do wish that we could see more of these lovely styles, but as someone who still enjoys the lore of each region and how their story in the game is made and inspired from, I can't just not talk about every character's real-life relation and how it may reflect what would happen in the game once the region releases. Plus, we haven't seen my favorite tribe yet. So in this video, will go over exactly that as well as some small theories I have at the end that's related to the recent Archon quest as well as the possible world order of Tevat based on what Mavuika has to say. Also disclaimer I may butcher some words so without further ado on with the video. Starting with Molani, the Wave Chaser. Her name stems from the Hawaiian chiefess meaning heaven or sky, a member of the Mezdli village which is named after the Aztec god or goddess of the moon. Mezdli also refers to the 13 heavens in Nahua mythology. The tribe of Mezdli is the first heaven translating to sky where the moon moves. This is worth mentioning since the other two characters, Kenich and Kachina's villages are also from the 13 heavens. So we can assume that six or more of these heavens will be represented as tribes and villages in Natland. Molani is also a member of the People of the Springs, which seems to be the Hydro tribe who once forgot their past and listened to the waves based on the unfinished reverie. Her reputation as an exceptional guide stems from her bloodline, said to be forerunners who map the world, likely the entirety of Tevat or just Natlan, traversing perilous paths and transforming them into networks of orderly lines on their maps. Now we can assume that the People of the Springs are known for being Wayfinders, and is likely how she obtained her Hydro vision. Wayfinders, originally originating from Polynesia and the Pacific Islanders are known for traversing the waters without navigational tools and only using the stars, the sun, and the waves, which is very much related to Setlali, who is also related to astrology. Now going back to Unfinished Reverie, their people forgetting the echoes of the waves would mean that they forgot their identity as wayfinders. Her constellation, Foca Neomonacus, are two genuses of seals, so the fact that she's riding a shark while also being a seal is quite concerning. She mentions volcanic eruptions and Core flowers, as well as performances by Koholasaurs in her travels, of which Kohola means whale in Polynesia. Now we might have seen such Koholasaurs in the Saurian trailer that could traverse through water and lava. If we go back to Molani, the Hawaiian chiefess, she was also the princess of a place called Koholau, a shield volcano which might also be found near their village of Mestli. Now there's another word called Kohala, which is another extinct shield volcano in Hawaii. So maybe we get to see more representations of these volcanoes and their mythology for their tribe down the line. Kachina's name comes from the Katsina spirit from Hopi culture of what seems like Southwest America. These are known as spirits of all things and are found in everything in the universe. Her first name, Utabiti, means firm and steadfast in the Swahili language and reflects her lofty personality. Her constellation, Okotona Princeps, is the real-life representation of Pikachu, a close relative of a rabbit in North America. Her geovision is also a huge hint to her role in Natlan. Kachina hails from the Nanatskayan mining tribe, which if translated to Nahuatl means where the obsidian knives are creaking, which has a pretty interesting set of gods and phenomenons related to being unlucky, like Bennett and Kuhn. Tour. Now it's likely that this village is responsible for Natland's obsidian harvest and manufacturing. An area full of tapitlisauri, which means mountain saurus in Nahuatl, excavated shiny gems and heroic tribal stories. Gems and minerals such as jade and gold are highly valued in Mesoamerican culture. The jade or gold gems from the depths could be related to the artisan in Unfinished Reverie long ago. The tribal stories of Natlan could also come from the region's mural paintings that were mentioned in recent lore. Her tribal elders telling stories are also reminiscent of Vanessa's tribe, who passed down crucial knowledge through storytelling. The people of her tribe are called Children of Echoes, which likely reflect the echoes of caves and the geography of the Nanatskayan Mountains. Pulsing musical instruments in music studios could mean the instruments unique to Natlan, probably similar to the ones played in all of their trailers and teasers. Her origins along with the pilgrimage of the Sacred Flame's return reminds me of Bennett as well as Kuntur and their insane bad luck and ostracization from society by the gods. But these trials that Kachina, Kuntur, and even Bennett have to go through is possibly a way to commune with Natlan's Pyro Dragon Sovereign. As gods are represented as the sun in Mesoamerican culture, then it could also mean the sun god returning to Natlan in this context. A pilgrimage that possibly Vanessa and her tribe has gone through for the return of the sun god or Pyro Archon slash dragon of the region. 
Kanich is one of Natland's heroes who is too angry and edgy to die, and is likely the only other Dendro character that I will use apart from Nahida and Kave. His constellation Chimera Alebrius is symbolic of the colorful cosmic creature of destiny from Mexican folk art, while his name seems to be derived from the Mayan sun god, Kinich Ahau, which is symbolic of the sun itself and also represents an undying nature. All of this is reflective of his vibrant colors and his immortal nature as well as the inspirations from both African and Mesoamerican heroes that defy death. The titles Turnfire Hunt, The Saurian Hunter, as well as The Turnfire Knight, and the Night Kingdom all might reflect rituals of Mesoamerican culture, using ritualistic fires that symbolize purification and transformation. Now this sounds quite terrifying for someone who hunts aberrants or deviated forms of creatures. His profession, which involves charging money for being a flame bearer and only hunting on auspicious knights, sounds similar to bounty hunters or hitmen, as well as the auspicious knights of hunting in Mesoamerican and African cultures. This is even more terrifying since many villages in Natlan live with Saurians. The village of Huitztlan draws its name from the Huitztlan god as well as the southern hemisphere in Aztec mythology, referring to the fourth heaven, the sky of the big star. This pairs well with Kinich's own name, constellation, and his relation to Kuhul Ajao, which translates to divine lord or supreme king in several Mayan and Aztec languages. So Kuhul Ajao calling himself the Almighty Dragon Lord actually checks out. His visual representation matches the flames at the end of the Ignition teaser, suggesting that he might truly be the Pyro Sovereign who lost his memory long ago, quite similar to Goba and Marcosius. Next, the cryo-vision holder Sitlali is derived from the Nahuatl translation of Star, aligning with what seems to be her occupation in Natlan as a fortune reader or a diviner, of which connections to celestial bodies and cosmic guidance is a common theme in Mesoamerican and African culture. Astrology and celestial themes in such cultures hold great importance as they use stars to predict certain events. And we all know about Genshin's fake stars and fate and constellations created by Celestia. One such example is the Mayan calendar, with its complex counting and determining auspicious days. Her design is reminiscent of the Quetzal birds with decorative and vibrant color schemes, maybe with a creative spin using hues of purple and pink. Now when it comes to the more pronounced animal features like Shilonen, her name might be inspired from the Aztec goddess Chicomecoatl, associated with fertility, growth, agriculture, and the earth itself and might be further emphasized in her abilities as a Geo user. Chikomekowatl is a female counterpart of Sentiotl, roughly meaning dried maize or corn, of which the female counterpart is Shilonen, meaning doll made of corn. And everybody loves corn, am I right? Moving on, jaguars and leopards are significant symbols of power, the night, and the underworld as well as strength and leadership in both Mesoamerican and African cultures. Pair this with Kenichi's Saurian night hunter occupation, then a theory that Natlan's tribes still have tension against each other is also likely. Moving on to Natlan's version of Clorinde, Chaska's name comes from the Indian deity Chaska Silur, or Silur, associated with dawn and twilight as well as protector of young maidens. She has similar ties with Sitlali and especially Kenich as a hunter and that they are connected to celestial bodies as well as moments of transition and change. Her feathered bird-looking headdress is reminiscent of eagles or hawks which are symbols of power and freedom as well as the sun's journey into the heavens or into the night. A recurring concept of change and transition that is very prevalent in the recent lore about Natlan. Now I've talked about Yensa many times before and I'm glad to do it again. Yensa is named after the spiritual Orisha Oya Yensenan or Yansa, a deity in Yoruba mythology and Afro-Latin American traditional religions. Oya is a warrior goddess of fire, storms, lightning, hurricanes, as well as death and rebirth, of which the concept of death and rebirth has been made clear in the Travail teaser, Incandescent Ode to Resurrection, and the Abyssal Translation, Rise O Strongman and Go to Your Destined Victory which very much would reflect what Mavika is doing at the end of the teaser. Interestingly, Yansen's color scheme is similar to the ball being passed around through the different tribes of Natlan. So it's likely that the tournament is being held near Yansen's village or is hosted by her tribe. Now, apart from the possible Archon Mavika, Oya being a goddess of fire and lightning might mean that Yansen is either Electro or Pyro or maybe even a dual element. So here's to having double vision characters in the future. 
The edgy rakan looking character, Ororon, is actually translated to Olorun, which is the supreme deity of Yoruba religion and cosmology as creator and overseer of the world, which suggests that he knows about Netlan or maybe Tevat's divine authorities and creation as well as the laws or heavenly principles of Tevat. He may also have relations with Jensen, making him the perfect guide for someone like Capitano who likely already knows about the secrets of the false sky. There have been rising theories suggesting that he's a hilly churl based on the tattoos that he has as well as his clothing and hairstyle. Paired with his knowledge of the heavenly principles then this is very likely. His heterochromia is also worth noting. And the only element that hasn't been seen yet is Electro and Animo. So judging from his design, he's possibly a new style of double element as well. Or maybe a delusion and vision user that resides in Natlan as a spy or sleeper agent from Sneznaya. He could possibly be a member of the House of Hearth. And we all know how our diplomatic relations with Arlecchino ended. Capitano is likely not going to be Pyro, Hydro, or Animo, at least when it comes to his vision. Now we know that Capitano has basically joined the Ring of Fire of Natlan, and is already involved with whatever is going to happen. But based on how he interacts with Mavuika, she's basically aware of his presence in Natlan already. And looking at where he is at that moment, it's likely one of the volcanoes of Natlan or a deep location in the depths of Natlan which if we go back to the unfinished reverie, hides the secrets of forbidden knowledge. A crack theory I have for Capitano being in Natlan specifically is that he is actually from Natlan. Either one of the six tribes or maybe even the flame-touched Moratan that almost never returned after their own pilgrimage. His sheer strength alone is reminiscent of Vanessa's tribe, and maybe even stronger. He also exhibits his greatness and strength similar to many stories and lore about Natlan's people. So maybe that's why he covers his face. I mean, Mavuika wouldn't have just gone past him if he was familiar with him already. But he also has dark hair, so here's to hoping it turns red when he actually uses whatever power he has. Lastly, we have Mavuika and what seems like the sacred flame of Natlan. Her name seems to be from the Maori fire deity Mahuika, traditionally depicted as the goddess of fire, the creation of fire itself, and the secret to making fire. Interestingly, she is also the consort and wife of Oahiturwa, the origin of fire as well as the personification of comets. Now, remember when Dane Steve said this? The rules of war are woven in the womb. The victors shall burn bright, while the losers must turn to ash. When the god of war shares this secret with the traveler, it is because she has her reasons. This secret is likely connected to this scene here, and Mavuika will reveal the secret to quite a lot of possible things, especially considering her name's inspiration is the creation of fire and the wife of the origin of fire. The secret to Natlan's fire, the history of the dragons, the past with the heavenly principles, or the secret of change and transition between eras. Now what Mavuika says is also similar to Caribear's lines. Once fully completed, the moment it gains the power to weave ley lines, it loses the lower level ability to influence memories. But it also becomes a tool that can change the entire world. Now changing the world and recreating it to suit one's desire is one thing, based on Carrie Bear, but an illusion of reality is more akin to, and is terrifyingly, the same as what Nicole says. Unfortunately, the fate of Tevat cannot easily be changed. History does not change easily, but human hearts can. Believe your own eyes. Only that which you see is true. What is unseen is but an illusion. What our eyes see ought to be our fate. But now, Close your eyes and feel, for with our blood, we will forge our true fate. This brings a whole new meaning to everything she warned us about as well as the possibility that everything happening around us is actually not real. 
We may also understand the reason behind the tournament of Natlan and why everyone seems to want to not participate. In the Genshin manga, people of Natlan used to celebrate these tournaments and would sing praises for their Archon. But now they're all declining to participate, taking away the once great traditions of Natlan and Murata. Especially since none apart from one or two characters here are Hyro. The ball being passed around could also be a reference to the Mesoamerican Poktapok ball game. Back to Mavika's husband, it's possible that Shablanke in Genshin, who was entombed with primal fire, is that same person. Maybe the origin of fire lies with Shablanke, and Mavika is the person who keeps that flame from dying out. I mean, she also mentioned it in the teaser. So maybe Natlan has no actual pyro element. Again. And the six or more tribes who all possess some form of pyro need to come together again and revive that pure pyro authority to free Shbalanke. Now there's a certain tribe of red-haired people of Natlan called the Flame Touch Muratans. And they're not just the people of Natlan too. They're called Children of Murata, similar to Kachina and the Children of Echoes. But this time, it's the actual Archon's children. But they're not in Natlan, at least not anymore. I'm pretty sure that we'll get more info and ultimately be able to meet Vanessa's tribe the more we get into Natlan, but maybe they never did, and that's why only Mavika has red hair. But something about what their tribe has done, which is leaving Natlan, might be connected to everything happening now. The tournament that every other tribe doesn't want to compete in, the lack of celebration, as well as the lack of quote-unquote war. People don't seem to want to compete in Natlan's tournament, which is something that also seems to be a recurring event. Granted, Mesoamerican ball games like these sometimes include human sacrifices for those that lose. I mean, Mavika also said it herself. This is a competition of winners, and the winner takes all. But this video is already too long for my liking, so I'll have to end it here, and that's basically it for me. So we can only wait until the next Natland teaser slash trailer drops so we can add more into our lore and theory books. So for now, I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!